Back when I first started this channel, more than a year ago, I asked my three viewers whether there was any particular subject they wanted me to cover. The topic that came up most often was Terra Mechanics uh, and the issues of traction prediction. So this video, the first part in a series, is an attempt to start answering some of those questions. In this video I'm going to cover the Micklethwaite equation, uh, Coulomb, angles of internal friction and cohesion. I hope you enjoy the video. Let's suppose you wanted to calculate how much drawbar pull an off-road vehicle could produce. You could try using a calculation based on a coefficient of friction, but when it comes to understanding the traction of off-road vehicles, friction doesn't tell us the whole story. Apart from anything else, models that are based purely on the coefficient of friction tell us that the tyres or tracks we fit don't make any difference to how much traction the vehicle can produce. To get to grips with off-road traction, we first need to understand a bit about soil. Soil is made up of a mixture of particles. As far as tractive ability is concerned, it's the size of those particles that is most important to us. The chemistry of the particles is largely irrelevant. So the important difference between sand and clay is that sand is made up of big particles, big enough to be seen with the naked eye, whereas clay, which chemically is made of the same stuff, is made of tiny particles. You can make rocks into sand and sand into clay by grinding the particles smaller. Anybody who's ever tried to build a sand castle knows that you need some moisture to get soil particles to stick together. But even wet sand doesn't stick together very well. Clay, on the other hand, sticks together so well that you can make cups and plates out of it. We call that stickiness cohesion. So with clay, it's fairly obvious that if you dig a tyre cleat into it, you can effectively grab hold of the ground and pull yourself along. Because the clay sticks to itself, you can generate a force just by trying to tear a lump off. But sand doesn't work like that. To generate traction on sand, you need to press the sand particles together. Because they're big and rough, they're very resistant to sliding past each other. The measure of that resistance is referred to as the angle of internal friction. The proportion of sand and clay in a particular soil varies from one place to another, depending on factors like local geology. In some areas the soil will be almost pure sand, whereas in others it will be almost all clay. In many places there will be a mixture of clay and sand, so that the soil has both cohesive and frictional properties. Back in 1776, a French military engineer called Charles Augustin de Coulomb demonstrated that it was possible to measure the cohesion and angle of internal friction of a sample of soil. This Coulomb, incidentally, is the same Coulomb that gave his name to the unit of electrical charge. Nowadays, the definitive way to measure the proportion of cohesive and frictional strength in a particular soil is to use a device called a soil shear box. This machine takes a matchbox sized sample of soil and attempts to slide the top half of the sample relative to the bottom half, causing a shear failure in the middle of the sample. This machine also applies a variable amount of vertical force to the sample. With no vertical force applied, all of the shearing resistance of the sample comes from cohesion. The test is repeated with incrementally increasing amounts of vertical force applied, which leads to a proportional increase in the shear force. The shear and vertical stresses, i.e. the measured and applied forces, divided by the cross-sectional area of the samples, are plotted on a graph. The slope of this graph is the angle of internal friction, and the intercept of the graph is the cohesion of the sample. During the Second World War, a researcher working at the Chertsey Military Research Centre in the UK, called E. W. E. Micklethwaite, developed an equation to predict the maximum amount of traction that a vehicle could produce on any particular soil, which he called H max. The equation he produced had four important elements to it. Two vehicle parameters, the total contact pack size of the driven tyres or tracks, and the weight of the vehicle, and two soil parameters, the soil cohesion and the angle of internal friction. Micklethwaite multiplied the contact area, referred to as A, by the cohesion C to calculate the amount of traction available through pure cohesion. On dry sand, that will be zero, but on a soil that contains clay, 
you can increase the amount of traction available by increasing the size of the contact patch, and thus grab a bigger area of the ground with the tyre or track cleats. Micklethwaite then added the weight of the vehicle W, multiplied by the tan of the angle of internal friction phi, to give the amount of traction available through friction. On a sandy soil, phi might be 40 degrees or more, providing a traction force of 84% of the weight of the vehicle. So on a sandy soil, by making the vehicle heavier, you can increase the amount of traction available. Micklethwaite's equation allows us to start making some informed decisions about the design of an off-road vehicle based on the type of terrain where it might operate. If you're going to be on dry sand, then increasing the weight of the vehicle will increase the amount of traction you can produce. But if you're going to be on clay, then you need to increase the size of your contact patches. What Micklethwaite doesn't tell us is anything about the shape of the slip pull curve, or the effect of sinkage and rolling resistance on the amount of traction a vehicle can generate. But those are a story for another video.